Acts chapter 19, as we continue our study, our look at the life of Paul and how God changed the world through this man and those who worked alongside him. And that's our job. Remember, we as Christians, our responsibility is not just to keep hope alive or to have this kind of fortress mentality where we're, where we're continuing some old traditions in spite of what the world says. That's not victory. Victory is we are here to transform lives through the power of God. And that's what Paul does, and we see a lot of lessons from him. Now, in 1971, uh, the Beatles had been broken up for about a year, and John Lennon, the lead singer, sat down at his big Steinway piano at his home in Berkshire and composed a brand new song. And it would turn out to be his most successful solo song ever. It was a song about how all of humanity could be a brotherhood of man and with all the people of the world living life in peace. And some of you already know what song I'm talking about. It's titled Imagine. And it became, like I said, his most popular solo song. It became critically acclaimed. Uh, in 2004, Rolling Stone named Imagine number three on its list of the top 500 songs of all time. Uh, another organization named it the Song of the 20th Century. And it is a beautiful song, musically speaking. I, I know that some of you right now are humming it in your heads. Lyrically, it speaks of a world where there's nothing to divide human beings anymore. No more borders, no more politics, no more possessions, not even religion. Uh, and a lot of people would look at that and say, yes, that's the world we should be aiming for. However, as beautiful as it sounds, it has been attempted several times, and it has always failed. Anytime a person or a group of people has stepped forward and said, okay, we're in charge now, so we're going to remove all the things that separate people, that's, that divide people into classes, that cause conflict, and we're going to make everybody equal, it always ends in mass murder. It always ends in starvation, poverty, failure. We're talking about the Soviet Union. We're talking about Mao's Cultural Revolution, the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. Further back, the French Revolution started out, let's, let's get everybody on level plane and ends up with a guillotine and blood flowing through the streets of Paris. And I'm not saying there's no hope for humanity. I'm saying there absolutely is, but there's only hope in one. And I want to talk today about what it looks like to see the transformation of not just a city, but an entire region. And I want us to imagine, see what I just did there? So I want us to imagine what it would look like if it happened here. So uh, in Acts 19, Paul is in the city of Ephesus, which some scholars believe was the second largest city in the ancient world. It was a major city in what we know today as Turkey. They called it Asia Minor back then. A little confusing when you read in the Bible and it talks about Asia. It's not talking about the continent today with China and India and so many of those countries, largest continent in the world. So that confuses people. When, when the Bible talks about Asia, it's talking about Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. Paul had preached there once before. He had preached there uh, on, on one of his missionary journeys and had only been there a brief while. He was followed by a guy named Apollos. Apollos is someone we're not really paying attention to in our study of Paul's life right now, but he was a very eloquent and gifted speaker. He came along and you might say watered the seed that Paul had planted. And then Paul came back and ended up spending three years there, three full years, which for Paul was a record. He usually only spent a few weeks or months in a place. As soon as the church was planted, he moved on. Ephesus, he was there three years. This was, again, a major city. Uh, you've heard of the seven wonders of the ancient world, right? The Astrodome hadn't been built yet. So the seven wonders of the ancient world, one of them was in Ephesus, the temple of Artemis, and it becomes a very important part of our story. And it, the story begins when Paul enters Ephesus and encounters these 12 men who are followers of John the Baptist, which is a little unusual because John was beheaded by Herod decades ago. So we don't know what their belief system is other than just repenting of their sins and waiting for the Messiah. But Paul meets them and says, guys, I need to tell you the rest of the story and proceeds to tell them about Jesus and about his crucifixion for our sins and his resurrection from the dead and the coming of the Holy Spirit. These men believe, they're baptized, the Holy Spirit comes into them and they become the foundation of a brand new church, a great, great church, the church in Ephesus. So we pick up the story with verse 8. And he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. 
This continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So remember, if you, if you were with us a few weeks ago and you really got a sharp mind, chapter 16. Paul's second missionary journey is beginning. He and Barnabas have just had their split. He, he takes Silas and they start on this missionary journey. They're going to go and, and visit the churches that he and Barnabas had planted just a few months before and see how they're doing. So they go and they visit those churches, some of which are in Asia. And then at the end of that, he says, okay, let's keep going. Let's just evangelize this whole region because that's how Paul thought. If he knew there was a city with no church, he wanted to plant a church there. But something interesting happened, something unexpected and unusual. God said no. And we're not given any explanation why. We're not told how Paul felt, but we can guess that Paul was probably frustrated and confused. First time in his life, anybody ever, the Lord himself ever told him not to preach. People had tried that before and he'd said, well, kill me, I don't care. But when Paul said, when God says don't preach, Paul listens. So he ends up having to go to another continent to preach the gospel. He goes to Europe in the city of Macedonia or the region of Macedonia. So we wonder in, in chapter 16 why God didn't let him preach in Asia Minor. Well, now we know because he had his own right time. And that was in chapter 19. Because as we just read, through Paul's three years in Ephesus and the work the Holy Spirit did through him, the whole region heard about Jesus. And I don't think that's hyperbole. I think it means that in every city in that region, cities like Colossae, which would later receive the letter of the Colossians, cities like Laodicea, one of the seven churches that received the revelation of St. John. In all those cities throughout that region, every city had a church and the gospel was being preached. And people who just a few years before, just a few months before, had never even heard the name of Jesus, now knew the gospel story and had a chance to believe. Now, if you think that's powerful, look what happens next. Verse 11. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. It's an interesting term that Luke uses there, isn't it? Extraordinary miracles. It's like, it's a little redundant, isn't it? It's almost as though Luke is saying, you know, these aren't one of these boring everyday miracles. These are really special. But it's accurate because these kinds of miracles had never happened in Paul's life before, where he would, he would just be doing his work and, and wiped the sweat of his brow with a handkerchief and someone grabbed it when it hit the ground and rushed off and handed it to someone who was sick and they immediately got well. And Paul got done with his tent making work and took off his dirty apron and someone snuck in and stole it and passed it around to people who were demon possessed or mentally ill or crippled or deaf or blind. And every one of them were healed as soon as they touched that garment. I mean, none of, nothing like that had ever happened in Paul's life before. And as far as we know from Acts, it never happened again. So why here? Why now? Well, Luke doesn't tell us, but we, can, we know from history and from this chapter, Ephesus was sort of a center for witchcraft. It was a center for magic cults, people who believed in the power of casting spells and, and, and reading out curses and consulting mediums and all that sort of stuff. In fact, we're going to find out it was a big part of the Ephesian economy. And so I think God was through Paul saying, you want access to spiritual power? Let me show you where the real spiritual power comes from. And then what happens next is, there, there are these seven amateur exorcists, which is a term you don't hear much these days. Seven sons of a local Jewish high priest named Sceva who decide, you know, we can make some money doing what Paul does. He's a fool. He does it for free. We'll do it and make money. And we've heard what he says. We can just repeat the same magic words he does. So they found a demon-possessed man and they cornered him in a room and all seven gathered around him. And they said, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. I'm, I'm sure they thought we throw Paul's name in there too. It's going to have special power. In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, come out immediately. And the demon looked them in the eyes and said, oh, I know who Jesus is. And I know about Paul, but who are you? And he immediately jumped on them. And one, one man against seven, he whipped them all and left them naked and bleeding, sprinting out of that place, humiliated. And we read that, and, and I think that's one of the funniest things in the Scriptures. But the response in Ephesus was not comical. So look at what happened in verse 17. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all. 
And the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. The the word extolled means praised enthusiastically. But why did they become afraid? Why, Why did the people of Ephesus, why were they filled with fear? I think it's because they recognized, hey, we've been messing around with stuff we don't completely comprehend. We've gotten in over our heads with these spell books we've bought and these these spells we're trying to use and and all these rituals we're going through to try to acquire power. Look what happened to those seven guys. I mean, they lived, but something worse could happen to us. They were filled with fear. Verse 18 says, Also many of those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices, and a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to be 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Now, I I did some research and found out that 50,000 pieces of silver in in the first century would come to 135 years of wages for one average worker. 135 years. If my math is correct, based on the average salary of the American blue-collar worker today, that would be $7 million in today's money. So this was a huge, huge loss, financially speaking. Any of us would have said, well, okay, you, you, you're done with this stuff, so why not put it on Amazon, right? Why not, or at least give it away? Well, because the Ephesians understood. This stuff poisoned our souls. We're not going to poison someone else with it. It needs to be burned. It needs to be gotten rid of before it leads someone else down the path of darkness. And it's not just the dabbling in the occult that they were concerned with. It was the motive behind it. See, why why do you need magic? Why do you need this supernatural power? Well, one of two reasons. Either you've got an enemy who you want to curse, or you've got uh, some, something you can't live without that you need to acquire and you need help acquiring it, right? And the Ephesians said, hey, now that we know Jesus, we don't want to curse our enemies anymore. We, we see them through the eyes of Jesus. We want to see them repent. We want to see them find the, the love and the joy and the peace that we've had. So we pray for them. We love them. We don't want to put a curse on them. We want to see them saved. And as far as things that we can't have, that we can't acquire on our own, well, if we needed them, God would give them to us. Oh, sure, if He gives us great wealth, we'll thank Him for it. If He gives us, if he gives us earthly success, if He gives us good health, if He gives us, uh, you know, enables us to fall in love with some wonderful person and, and have a, a, a happy family, then, then we'll praise God for it. But we don't need any of that stuff to be joyful. We've got Jesus. We've got the bread of life. The rest is just dessert. So why pass along something that feeds the darker impulses in human beings? You don't need that stuff. That's the point they were making. And that is when the trouble started. You see, the temple of Artemis, as I said earlier, was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. You don't understand how big a deal that was. That drew in people from thousands of miles away. People would come to view the temple of Artemis and check it off their box and say, okay, from here, I'm going to go see the pyramid in Giza or I'm going to go see the hanging gardens of Babylon. But the fact that people came from miles around meant that all these people in Ephesus made a living off the temple of Artemis. First of all, the temple itself was a bank. Interesting fact, I learned as I researched this. Whole nations banked their money at the temple of Artemis. But then there were all these side businesses. There were people who, who ran brothels and, and inns and taverns and food stands and souvenir shops. And one of the souvenir shop owners was a guy named Demetrius. Demetrius sold silver statues of the goddess Artemis, which if you hear that term, statues of a goddess, and you picture in your mind the Venus de Milo, don't. I've actually found pictures of these statues online. You can look it up. They're grotesque, disgusting little things. And yet they were making this guy a living. And he became upset. He became anxious. All these people are turning to this Jesus. And they're no longer following Artemis. And that's going to hurt my business. And so he began a riot. He started spreading the rumor that these, these Christians, these people of the way, as they called themselves, these followers of the Nazarene, they're going to destroy the Ephesian economy. They're going to bring the, the wrath of the goddess down upon us. We, they must be stopped. And thousands of people crowded into the arena there in the center of Ephesus. They managed to grab two of the local Christians, uh, Aristarchus and Gaius. Somehow they didn't grab Paul. We don't know how, but they dragged these two poor Christians into the center of the arena. And for two hours, they chanted, great 
is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. It's a, it was a mixture of economic anxiety and wounded civic pride and racial hatred. And, and, and in Greek, it must, have, it must have sounded terrifying. In Greek, it sounded something like this. Megale he Artemis Ephesion. Megale he Artemis Ephesion. Can you picture thousands of people with their fists in the air chanting that over and over again for, for two hours? And we see all through history what happens when a group of people get together, whether it's people at a football game today or a lynch mob 100 years ago. People lose their minds. And if you're a Christian in Ephesus at this time, you are terrified. In fact, we know how Paul felt about it because he wrote about it in 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 9, written just a few months after this incident. He writes, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Paul was not in the habit of exaggerating. He said, we were sure we were all dead. Any minute now, they're going to they're gonna break loose, they're going to come out of that stadium, and they're going to attack every Christian home and burn it to the ground. They're going to string some of us up. They're going to make examples of us. They're going to wipe us from the face of the earth. Paul knew, and the Ephesian Christians knew, they were dead. In Romans 16.4, he says, Priscilla and Aquila, my two tent-making friends, he said, they risked their lives for me. This was written at about that time, so we assume it had something to do with this riot. We do know from Luke in Acts that local officials, people who weren't even believers, just local officials, wrote messages to Paul saying, do not go to the stadium. Do not address the crowd. Because that's exactly what Paul wanted to do. He was, he was desiring to, to go into that arena and address the crowd and try to talk them down and explain the gospel to them. But the Ephesians restrained him. We can picture probably four or five of the biggest, strongest Ephesian Christian men standing around him saying, Paul, you got to get through us and you're not getting through us. You're staying right here. Now, why would non-Christian local politicians care what happened to this outside evangelist? The only answer I can come up with is they didn't yet believe in Jesus, but they were, thank they were thankful for what the gospel had done to their community. And they didn't want to see that stopped. Paul also, in a sense, writes about this in Ephesians 6.12. You've probably heard Ephesians 6.12 if you've read the Bible. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. One of the spookier verses in all the Bible N.T. Wright says, when you mess with demonic power, it has a way of punching back. And he's right. I think this riot happened because the devil was scared and the devil was doing what he could. In fact, in fact, it, it, well, let me get to that in just a moment. I, I need to end the story of the riot first. You're probably worried about what happened to Gaius and Aristarchus. I'm sure I, I can see you, right? So the day in the end is saved by the unlikeliest of all heroes, the town clerk, a local bureaucrat, so anonymous, Luke doesn't even give him his name, give us his name, strides into the arena, stands in front of the chanting mob, manages to quiet them down and says, hey, listen, you understand these men have done nothing wrong? I mean, they're just practicing their faith just like you are. If you've got a problem with anything they've done and you want to file a suit against them, we've got law courts. That's what they're for. File a lawsuit tomorrow. We'll rule on it as quickly as possible. Otherwise, leave them alone. But right now, you better disperse because word is going to get to Rome and there's going to be legions marching on Ephesus within the week. And you don't want legions in Ephesus. And the people dispersed at the words of this brave and wise man. But not only were Paul and the other Ephesians and especially Gaius and Aristarchus relieved to be rescued, even more importantly, that set a legal precedent. From now on, wherever Paul or any other Christian evangelist went in the Roman world, when they faced local opposition, they could say, hey, the town clerk in Ephesus, second biggest city in the world, by the way, the town clerk said, it's perfectly legal for us to spread this message. So let's just take stock of what has happened here. The gospel comes to Ephesus, transforms an entire region. The devil's best response is, well, I'm going to beat up these seven Jewish exorcists. I know they're not Christians, but uh, they're the best I can do because God won't let me touch the believers in Jesus. 
but maybe that'll intimidate them. Maybe they'll stop when they see what I did to these seven amateur exorcist guys. Well, it doesn't work. So then he says, okay, well, I'll start a riot. And guess what happens? A legal precedent is set that clears the way for the gospel to open doors from now on. If you ever read the Bible and get the sense that whatever the devil does, God's always three or four steps ahead of him, that's because that's exactly right. And that ought to give us all a great deal of comfort. Is the devil real? Are demonic powers real? Absolutely. Do we need to worry about them? No way, not at all. Not as long as we're walking in the steps of Jesus. He's our savior. He's our guide. He's our defender. But now, now I want you to dream with me for a moment. I want you to imagine what it would look like if something like this happened in Montgomery County. I'm excited about this stage in our church's life, about the possibility of 10,000 transforming relationships, 10,000 times people in this church get involved with people in or outside the church who need help and, and see what God can do. But what if God says, you know, you think way too small, Burger? How about every single lost person in Montgomery County has at least one Jesus follower who has committed to love them in my name? Well, obviously that would take more than the people of this church. Okay, well, there's plenty of other churches in Montgomery County. What if God does that? What if literally every single lost person in Montgomery County has an encounter and an actual relationship with someone who loves them in the name of Christ? Do you think that would change things? I sure do. You know, we don't have a big problem with witchcraft around here as far as I know, but we do have the same root problems the Ephesians have. We hate people and we want stuff we can't have. We may not cast curses on people we hate, but we do our best to make their lives miserable in other ways and we poison our souls in the process. We don't call on demonic powers to make us happy and safe, but we do rely on the false gods of money, sex, and power, and politics and approval. So imagine a, a Montgomery County where none of that was the case, where you went to, your kids went to school and there were no bullies around. The bullies had become nice. What about a, a Montgomery County where there was racial equality and, and no divides between us based on socioeconomic factors? Think about a Montgomery County where, where families didn't break up anymore, where divorce lawyers had to get a new line of work, where lawyers in, in total, uh, at least trial lawyers, found themselves with a distinct lack of business because no one's filing suit and very few people are committing crimes. What about a, a county where suddenly everybody who right now struggles with suicidal thoughts, anxiety, depression, despair, loneliness, they understand in a deep heartfelt way, there is a God who loves me, who made me the way I am for a purpose and I have worth and I have dignity and my life means something. Imagine a Montgomery County where there's no more people making a living off the misery of others, like Demetrius selling his disgusting little silver statues. Uh, imagine a county where drug dealers have no clients anymore, where payday loan and title loan places go out of business because anytime somebody is, is broke or in debt, there's always somebody else who comes along and says, hey, you're my brother, you're my cousin, you're my neighbor, you're my coworker. I'm going to give you this money interest-free. You can pay me back whenever you want to because... I'm a believer in Jesus because he's been that generous to me. I'm going to be this generous to you. And you might say, that sounds great, Jeff, but it's fantasy. It can't happen. But it has. It still happens. Let me tell you just one story of it happening here in the United States. In 1830, in New York State, of all places, a gospel awakening broke out. It started in camp meetings preached by a guy named Charles Finney. You look him up, he's an interesting character. But in those camp meetings, people who had called themselves Christians their whole lives were falling on their knees in tears and confessing that they'd never really known Jesus, but now they need him. Lives were being transformed. You know, at the outset of this, religious leaders in New York State and local politicians were calling this hysteria and ridiculous nonsense, but they soon changed their minds. Do you know the, the district attorney of Rochester, New York, a major city, said that after this awakening broke out, the crime rate dropped by two-thirds. Saloons and taverns had to close because alcoholics got clean and sober and they didn't have enough business. This awakening spread throughout the United States. We call it today the Second Great Awakening. It changed the history of our nation forever. God's done it before. 
and God can do it again. So my challenge to you, my challenge to you is this week, you'll make a commitment that every day from today till next Sunday, you'll pray for awakening. Pray for it to start right here in Montgomery County. Pray for it to spread throughout our country. Would you pray that with me? Put it on your phone. Set a reminder. Put it on your refrigerator. Whatever's going to help you remember. If you're not signed up for our daily prayer email, sign up today because that's what I'll be writing about this week, Monday through Thursday. Pray and just tell God, Lord, here's the things that break my heart about our community. And I know they break your heart as well. And then ask Him, Lord, just let your power your spirit fall upon this region and transform everything. Would you do that? I wish, I wish somebody had a time machine so we could go back to 1971 to, to that bedroom in Berkshire, England and tell John Lennon, okay, you don't need to write the song because somebody's already working on that world you imagine. You want, you want a world of perfect peace? Jesus is bringing us a new earth. You want a, a world with no borders? Well, Jesus says in Revelation 7 that every nation, tribe, language, and people will stand together and worship the Lamb on His throne. You want a world where everybody's got plenty? Micah says it'll be a world where everyone sits under his own vine and his own fig tree, which is an Old Testament metaphor for prosperity and fruitfulness. Everyone will have more than enough. Jesus compared it to a wedding feast. You know, as the father of a daughter, when I hear wedding feast, I get anxiety. But in the ancient world, it wasn't that way. Weddings weren't a time of indebtedness and forced courtesy. They were a time when the master of the house brought out the best he had and everyone feasted and everyone laughed and drank and enjoyed themselves. And that's the picture Jesus paints of the coming kingdom of God. Aren't you happy to know that's what's coming? It's celebration. It's togetherness. It's joy. It's laughter. It's feasting. That's what's coming. He wanted a world of perfect peace. John Lennon did. Isaiah says it's going to be a world so peaceful, even the animals are peaceful. The wolves and, and lambs snuggle up together and, and lions and cattle graze in the same stall and a baby plays with a cobra and no one bats an eye because nothing is harmful in that world. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountains, says the Lord. In fact, there will be no sorrow, there will be no pain, there will be no death and God will wipe every tear from our eyes. He said he wanted a world with no religion. Well, guess what? Revelation 21, 7 says that on the new earth, there's no temple because we don't need it. Listen, I'm grateful for church buildings. I'm grateful for my position as a pastor in a church. I'm grateful for this opportunity we have to be a part of worship services and band together to try to change the community and, and teach the Bible. Religion, when it's based on the gospel, is a very good thing, but it's not a perfect or an ultimate thing. It's the best we got now. It's the best we can do as far as staying on track and following God together as a people. But when we get there, we won't need it anymore because we'll have a face-to-face -face relationship with Him. We'll see Him with our own eyes and touch Him with our own hands. And we'll know Him personally the way He's always known us. i got to be honest, I'm real curious what God has a plan for me as a vocation on the new earth because He's not going to need preachers anymore. And frankly, I don't have any other skills. So he's going to have to give me something else. I think he's got it covered. See, that's the world that's coming for us. And every time in this world, we see a life change. Every time we see someone's whole world turned on its head through the power of the gospel, you know what that is? That's more than just someone being saved. That's an appetizer for the feast to come. That's, as the old hymn says, a foretaste of glory divine. That's God saying, you see what I did with him? I'm going to do that with the whole world. I'm going to do that with every plant and every rock and every tree and every bird and every fish and every, every animal and, and every human being that's redeemed. All will praise my name for eternity. Every molecule will shout my perfection and my joy and my love forever and ever. Amen. So if that's what the appetizer looks like, are you hungry yet?